This is the third and uh, rather short selection about coherent selection, which is really picking up on two additional things that you can do with gradients, uh, which are a little bit different uh, to simply uh, selecting coherence transfer pathways. Uh, but these have turned out to be uh, rather useful in practical spectroscopy. So the first of these is how you can use gradients to do selective excitation. Now you may remember that when we talked about the vector model we distinguished between hard pulses which is when you make the B1 field very large so that all of the resonances in the spectrum experience the same field and soft or selective pulses where you deliberately make the field weak and you put the field on resonance with a particular spin and you, you arrange it so that that spin is excited and all of the other spins are not excited. And to do that you have to make the field weak enough that the other spins are not affected. So this is a selective pulse and selective excitation. And this is used quite a lot um, in all sorts of NMR experiments, sometimes to excite a single resonance, uh, as we would do in an NOE experiment, and sometimes to excite a range of resonances, as you might do, say, just exciting the alpha carbons or just exciting the NH protons or something like that in a more sophisticated experiment. So being able to do good selective excitation is important in a multiple pulse NMR. And it turns out gradients uh, make it possible for you to do this uh, in a rather nice way. And the basic idea is to do a spin echo using a selective 180 degree pulse. So we've got 90 delay, 180 delay, except this time the 180 degree pulse, instead of being a hard pulse, is a selective pulse. So only the spins which experience the selective pulse are refocused. The spins that don't experience the selective pulse, they just carry on evolving uh, as if the pulse wasn't there. And if you then add to that two gradients, uh, equal gradients either side of the 180 degree pulse, as I've already explained, uh, they will refocus the pathway which undergoes, uh, which experiences the 180 degree pulse. And all of the other spins which don't experience the 180 degree, 180 degree pulse will be dephased by both of these gradients. So the result of this is you end up with very, very clean selective excitation. So that, those spins which experience the 180 degree pulse, they are excited, they appear in the spectrum, and everything else is dephased. And this is quite important because if you just do normal selective excitation, you excite the signal you're interested in, but all of the magnetization from the other peaks is on the z-axis. And the moment you start doing anything else in your experiment, all of these strong signals will just appear the first time you do a 90 degree pulse. Whereas in this method, all of the magnetization from those other peaks has been dephased and so it's not going to come back to haunt you. So this gradient echo uh, is a very clean way of making selective excitation. And if instead of selective excitation you wanted to do selective inversion, which is what you'd want to do in an NOE experiment, all you need to do is put another 90 degree pulse on the end and that magnetization which has been refocused in the XY plane, you can flip it onto the minus Z axis. So using uh, this sequence B, you can actually also achieve selective inversion as well. And again, to emphasize the really key point, point here um, is that all of the other signals are dephased at this point. Now, if one spin echo is good, perhaps two would be better. And this thing is called the double pulsed field gradient spin echo. It's rather a mouthful. And this is basically doing the same thing twice. And you can see from this that only the magnetization which experiences the first pulse as a selective uh, refocusing pulse 
and the select second pulse as a selective refocusing pulse, only that magnetization will be refocused by the gradients. And the advantage of doing it twice is that you end up with a very interesting phase property. And again, you need to go back to when we were describing selective pulses. One of the problems with selective pulses is that the magnetization they create uh, has a phase error across it. So if you do a hard pulse, the magnetization goes down from Z to minus Y. If you do a selective pulse exactly on resonance, the selective pulse does the same thing, Z to minus Y. But as you start to go away from the exact middle of the selective pulse, you start to get a phase error um, as, uh, as the pulse generates um, more magnetization along the x-axis. And that's kind of an inevitable part of how selective pulses work. So if you do selective excitation, you almost end, always end up with a phase error in the spectrum, which is not necessarily very easy to cope with. And there's a very nice property of doing a double echo, which means that this phase error at the end of the second echo cancels. Um, in fact, that's related to this very old experiment, this Boom gill modification of the Carpacel spin echo train. It's actually the same property, but it's being used in a different context here. So this double gradient echo, although it's twice as long, it has the very, very nice property that it generates magnetization selectively without a phase error and everything else is dephased. So this turned out to be an extremely good way uh, of making very clean selective excitation. The only proviso is that the two gradient pairs have to be completely independent. So G1 has to refocus G1, and G2 has to refocus G2. So they have to have very different amplitudes or durations to make sure that you don't end up with G1 refocusing G2, or something else uh, more complicated. And the place where this um, excitation method has proved to be absolutely uh, uh, made a really big impact is in measuring uh, NOEs. So what you've got here um, is actually a transient NOE experiment. It's exactly the same as the one I described to you when we first talked about measuring the NOE. And the double gradient echo at the beginning, followed by the pulse of phase phi, that flips it onto the minus Z axis. So that whole section at the front, uh, that is just the selective inversion pulse. And then you do uh, the delay tau for the NOE to build up, uh, and then you uh, just acquire the signal. And as usual with these things, uh, you have to do a difference experiment in order to uh, reveal um, the NOE. So you would do the experiment once uh, with the phase x and once with the phase minus x, um, and that would generate um, your, your difference signal. And the really important point about this um, is that because all of the other signal is dephased, um, then the difference you're having to calculate is between two rather small things. So one of the problems with the NOE experiment has been that in the control experiment, most of the peaks are full intensity, and in the NOE experiment, most of the peaks are full intensity. And if you take the difference between them, uh, you're taking the difference between two large things. And to make that go away, to give you a, a zero, uh, it's very, it puts a lot of uh, stress on the stability of the spectrometer. For this method, because almost all the magnetization is dephased, you're creating a difference between uh, two very much smaller quantities. And this uh, routinely gives um, extremely high quality spectra. And I think this experiment really has uh, revolutionized the qu quality you can get from 1D NOE spectra. And here's just a very simple example of that. Um, the selectively uh, targeted resonances are shown uh, by the arrow. Uh, and all of the positive peaks there, this is a small molecule, uh, are NOEs. Uh, and you can see all of the other peaks that are uh, suppressed to a very high degree, even including this very, very strong singlet 
uh, just below 4 ppm there. So it really works very well indeed. And that same idea you'll find of the gradient echo has been incorporated into lots of uh, uh, one selective one-dimensional experiments and it's also often used as part of uh, 2D and more complex experiments. So that's the first uh, topic and the second thing I want to talk about um, is about this business of uh, zero quantum coherence. Now you remember from when we were talking about coherence orders that Z magnetization doesn't respond to a Z rotation and it therefore has coherence order zero uh, and zero quantum coherence that also doesn't respond to a Z rotation so that also has coherence order zero so when you're talking about selecting coherence order zero you can't get around the fact that at the same time as selecting Z magnetization you will also select zero quantum so for example in a nosy experiment during the mixing time you want to select Z magnetization but that means you're also going to be selecting zero quantum at the same time the two things have exactly the same properties and it's therefore very difficult to disentangle them now we mentioned that if you're going to select Z magnetization then you can just use a purge gradient you just apply a gradient everything else dephases uh, and you're just left with the Z magnetization and of course this is very nice but you need to remember that if you do this you risk contamination with zero quantum because the purge gradient when we say it gets rid of everything else in brackets it should say except zero quantum by the way uh, and sometimes we need to worry about that and under sort of unfavorable circumstances this can really cause significant problems you have a coupled spin system and imagine you've got two spins that have got an NOE between them but they're also coupled then when you do the nosy sequence you actually generate zero quantum between the two spins and that zero quantum appears uh, in such a way that it interferes with the NOE cross peak so that will make your NOE cross peak look like some horrible squashed thing like that whereas what you really want is the thing on the right which is what the NOE cross peak would look like if the zero quantum had gone away so these are what are sometimes called J cross peaks uh, in, in nosy spectra and they um, and there are other kinds of spectra uh, where similar things occur basically what zero quantum tends to do is to contaminate the spectrum with out of phase um, uh, components which mess up the thing you're looking for now there is a way around this it's a little bit fiddly uh, it does work very well um, but um, to describe you know how you get around this problem of zero quantum I need to step back a little bit and talk about this thing called um, the Z filter now this is just two 90 degree pulses separated by a delay and it's designed to select just in phase magnetization so let me explain how that works so at point A imagine we've got in phase magnetization along Y I1 Y uh, the first pulse flips that onto uh, the Z axis so I get I1 Z and of course there'll be lots of other things present in general but none of them will be on the Z axis so then you apply a gradient and that kills everything except the Z magnetization so now I've only got I1 Z left and then finally I do a 90 minus X pulse and I get minus I1 Y again which is what I started with so I start with I1 Y and I go through this 90 gradient 90 and I end up with I1 Y but everything else has been destroyed so this is why I say this is designed to select just in phase magnetization right so it's a way of selecting only a, 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 a component of magnetization on one axis and what's more just the in phase part it's not the antiphase term not the I1 Y I2 Z that gets destroyed as well and it's called a Z filter because the magnetization is placed on the Z axis between the two pulses 
However, it doesn't quite work because of this zero quantum problem. So suppose, and in general there's no reason not to suppose this, that at point A we had some antiphase along the x-axis. So that would be 2i1xi2z, for example. When we do the first pulse, that becomes in part zero quantum at point B, and therefore um, it's not dephased by the gradient. And so it gets regenerated by the second pulse, and so you end up with uh, some 2i1xi2z after the filter. So the filter is, doesn't work quite right because there are some antiphase terms that it won't reject. And the reason it won't reject those terms is because they end up on the uh, zero quantum during the mixing, during this time tau z. So, as it says at the bottom there, making this work is all about getting rid of the zero quantum. If we could get rid of the zero quantum during that time tau z, then this filter method would work exactly, and we would select only the in-phase component. So, how are we going to get rid of the zero quantum? Well, there's a relatively straightforward way, in, at least in principle, of doing this. And that is to realize that there is actually a, a difference between zero quantum and z-magnetization. And that is that zero quantum actually evolves as, over time. I mean, it's a coherence, and it will evolve at the zero quantum frequency, which is the difference of the offsets. Z-magnetization, on the other hand, just sits there uh, doing nothing. It doesn't evolve over time. So over this time tau z, the zero quantum will acquire a phase uh, omega 1 minus omega 2 times tau z, just the frequency times the time. So basically that tells us all we need to do is to do two experiments. One where tau z is zero, and then the phase will be zero. And then one where tau z is such that this phase is pi, is 180 degrees. And then if we add these two experiments together, the contribution from the zero quantum will just cancel. Because in the first experiment, the zero quantum contribution will come out along one axis, and in the second experiment, it will be exactly equal and opposite. So you can easily cancel the zero quantum just by repeating uh, the experiment twice with the right value for tau z. Now the difficulty is that in any real spectrum you will have more than one zero quantum so there'll be a range of zero quantum frequencies and what's more you may not even know what the zero quantum frequencies are because you don't already know what is coupled to what. So the way people get round this is they repeat the experiment for a range of tau values up to um, a value which is appropriate for the smallest zero quantum frequency. Right? So you choose, say, the smallest zero quantum frequency and say, well, I'm going to use that to set my maximum value of tau z, and then you choose a range of values in between. And there have been some quite clever work done on, on the correct way uh, to choose these other delays. But this is not ideal. Um, it's time-consuming because you have to keep on repeating the experiment for different values of tau z. It's a bit like phase cycling. And there's no guarantee it's going to work either because you may be just unlucky and not choose the right set of tau z values to actually cancel the zero quantum that you want. So although this kind of works in principle, um, it's not necessarily very convenient to do in practice. And the trick is to use the same idea, but implement it in a different way. And this is kind of involves some thought experiments to start with, you know, otherwise experiments you can't actually do. And then I'll show you how you actually do it in practice. So sequence A here is what we've been talking about. Right? That's just the Z filter with this variable delay tau Z. Now, if you wanted to, you could think of a slightly different way of doing this, 
where instead of varying tau z, you kept the delay between the two 90 degree pulses fixed and you inserted a spin echo into the delay. Now, why does that work? Well, if you think about the spin echo, the evolution during the first tau and the second tau refocus one another. So, effectively, the zero quantum actually evolves for a time tau z minus two tau, right? which is from the blue line to the end of the sequence. Now, there'd be no reason to do this in practice. I'm just saying this is like a thought experiment. It's another way which you could envisage doing it. You could vary the zero quantum evolution by putting a spin echo in this delay and moving the 180 degree pulse along. And what I'll show you is that there's actually a practical implementation of sequence B that you can actually do uh, using a special kind of 180 degree pulse uh, which is sequence C. And I'll explain to you how that works. So again, we're back to the realm of thought experiments. So think about experiment B. The problem with experiment B is you still have to repeat it for different values of the time tau. So it's still inconvenient. But what if instead of repeating the experiment for different values of tau, we could do different values of tau in different parts of the sample. So that's supposed to be your NMR tube there. At the top, the 180 is in one position, and then the 180 moves as you physically go down the sample. Now, of course, you can't do this, right? It's definitely a thought experiment, because if you apply a 180 degree pulse, it's, a, it's applied at the same time to the whole sample. But if you could do this, this would be a way of getting the zero quantum dephasing, uh, get it to cancel, because different parts of this sample would have different amounts of zero quantum evolution. So then when you added up the, the, uh, the signal over the whole sample, um, they, would, they would cancel out. And you'd only have to do the experiment once. So you have different values of tau in different parts of the sample. And so what we're saying is, that the time for evolution of the zero quantum becomes spatially dependent. And this should start to trigger some recollection now. When we talked about gradients, we talked about the phase being spatially dependent. But of course, that's exactly what you've got here, because if the time is spatially dependent, the zero quantum evolves for different times, and so you'll get different phases. So in fact, what this creates is a phase for the zero quantum which varies along the sample. And if we have that, that means the signal will dephase, just in the same way that it would in a normal gradient. So this thought experiment, if you could actually do it, would lead to zero quantum dephasing across the sample. So now, how do you actually do it in practice? So what you do is this sequence C. So first of all, you apply a gradient across the sample, but this is a rather weak gradient. It generates a range of frequencies across the sample, like a normal gradient does, but uh, not an enormous range, you know, just um, something that's comparable with the width of the spectrum. And then at the same time, you apply a special kind of 180 degree pulse which is called a, a swept frequency 180 degree pulse. Now what you normally do in a 180 degree pulse, or any pulse, is you just set the transmitter at a particular frequency and you apply the pulse. That's like a normal pulse. You can, if you want to, uh, do it a different way. You can start with the transmitter at the edge of the spectrum and you could sweep through the spectrum quite quickly and then it would effectively affect each peak in turn, and by the time you got to the other end, you'll have inverted all of the peaks in the spectrum. So that's a swept frequency pulse. Um, and these pulses uh, have certain advantages in some special applications, but the crucial thing that's interesting to us here is that the time 
at which the pulse is applied depends on the position in the sample. Right, now, how does that come about? Remember, we've got a gradient on, so the frequency depends on the position. So when I sweep the 180-degree pulse across all the frequencies, that's equivalent to sweeping the pulse down the sample. So at the top of the sample, it gets the 180-degree pulse soon on, and at the bottom, it gets it right at the end. So basically, by using this swept 180-degree pulse in conjunction with um, the weak gradient, I can actually end up with different parts of the sample experiencing the 180 at different times. And so that thought experiment can actually be created by this real experiment, and it all happens in one go. So you don't have to repeat the experiment for different values of the time. You just put on this weak gradient, do the swept pulse, and lo and behold, a zero quantum all disappears. Um, you have to get the parameters right. Um, so there's quite a complicated interaction between the parameters for the swept pulse, about how quickly it goes and where it starts and where it ends, and how strong the gradient is. But once it's set up once, um, it does work very well indeed. So this turns out to be uh, a very convenient way of suppressing the zero quantum um, and retaining the Z magnetization. And that's the thing that just a gradient on its own can't do. However, this all happens in one shot. You don't have to continuously repeat the experiment. And basically, you can implement this into anything where you've got, um, effectively, a Z filter. So, sequence A is actually the nosy, and if you think about a nosy, uh, that pulse tau pulse at the end, that's a Z filter, because we want Z magnetization during tau. And in fact, as I said right at the beginning, if you have zero quantum during tau, it gives you these J peaks, as they're called in nosy. So you can replace that delay tau delay by this zero quantum dephasing sequence, and that will clean up your nosy. Experiment B is a Z cozy. Um, this is a, a filtered cozy. Those last two flip angles are small. And although they're not two 90 degree pulses separated by a delay, um, they basically achieve the same thing as a Z filter, except instead of the magnetization passing through Z, it just passes through populations in general. And again, you can put a zero quantum dephasing between those two pulses, and that gives you very high quality spectra, which is actually quite difficult to get. The zero quantum interference is a big problem in the Z cozy. And C is the TOXI experiment that we talked about when we were talking about 2D. Uh, during the mixing time, you have this period of isotropic mixing. And I explained to you that that causes the transfer of Z magnetization from one spin to another through the J coupling. But actually, it goes through an intermediate state of zero quantum. So these uh, TOXI experiments uh, generate a lot of zero quantum, and you've got to suppress that uh, if you're going to get high-quality spectra. And so what you would normally do again is put in one of these uh, Z fil one of these zero quantum dephasing filters, both before and after the mixing time. So each of these experiments can be improved in a significant way uh, by the implementation of these zero quantum dephasing. And that really is the end.